Welcome back, church. Uh, we're uh, here for another session, uh, another evening. And uh, for those of you that caught up with the message last night, we started to look at the uh, seven feasts. I just wanted to lay a foundation uh, for the feasts. And um, I know that there'll probably be a lot more teaching that'll come out around this over the coming uh, days and weeks ahead. <clears throat> um, but the seven feasts last night, we covered the, uh, the feast of Passover. And the, the reference scriptures were the scriptures in Leviticus chapter 23. That chapter is actually dedicated to unfolding uh, the workings of the seven feasts. Um, if, we, if we want to put it into correct terminology, uh, I believe that the feasts uh, themselves are ordained divine appointments by God for his people. And so as we, as we come through and understand more clearly and more, uh, more specifically the function of these feasts, we can see that some of these feasts have been fulfilled. And what I mean by fulfilled is, is the, the fulfillment of God's ultimate plan for redemption of humanity. And as you know, uh, we covered this last night, but as you know, uh, Adam sinned uh, in the garden, um, and from that time on, all of humanity has been uh, wrestling with this area of sin or separation from God. In the garden, probably in its perfection, prior to sin entering the garden, we, we probably could uh, quite possibly see that this was God's ultimate plan was to tabernacle with mankind or to live with, uh, to be in close relationship with, uh, with, with humanity, his creation. Um, and I think the redemptive work, the redemption, uh, you know, really is about how, um, how we can get back to that place of true oneness and fellowship uh, with God, our creator. So we looked at the seven feasts. The first one was the feast of Passover. And um, that was really about uh, recognizing and celebrating uh, of, uh, in the Old Testament, it was around about uh, Moses and his role in leading the people of Israel out of captivity, out of Egypt, right, to, the, to their promised land. And, and they had a lot to do. They had to get across the Red Sea. But as a part of their getting out, um, there, there was a, a, a period of time where they had to sacrifice uh, a lamb, a perfect spotless lamb, and the blood of that lamb was to be painted on the lintel and on the door frames, and that as the, uh, the angel of death passed over Egypt, as you know, that all those who had the blood of the lamb uh, on their, their door lintel were, were saved, and the angel of death continued on to those houses and those places that did not carry the blood uh, which basically the firstborn of, of all of those uh, families and the firstborn of the livestock, and it went through a, a quite a significant thing, uh, were, were uh, killed and they died as a result of, of that. So that's in the Old Testament <coughs> and um, as a type and a picture of Jesus Christ, the, the Lamb of God. I think it's John the Baptist that says, Behold the Lamb of God. And so we see that Jesus is the Lamb. Uh, he is the perfect Lamb. He is without spot or wrinkle. He is without beguile, as it were. He is without sin. It says in the scripture that he was tempted by every means and every measure that we are tempted, but did not sin. There was no sin within him. And so we continue on. Uh, so we see that the fulfilment of that, uh, of that particular feast or that particular plan of redemption was actually fulfilled in Jesus Christ as he offered himself to die on the cross, perfect, sinless, as the Lamb of God to pay the price for our sin, for your sin, uh, so that we can come back to right relationship with him. Um, we see the second of the seven feasts, the unleavened bread. And uh, really this is a part of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross 
We know that the leaven represents sin. Jesus was without sin. Uh, so, you know, when we have the uh, Holy Communion and we take the implements, the, 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 uh, the, the wine or the, the, the blood, uh, the representation of the blood and the bread or the, the body, uh, we do that in remembrance of what Jesus has done for us, uh, both individually but also for his church. And I believe that there's an incredible picture and mandate for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in these days and certainly in these last days. We move forward <coughs> and uh, just to reiterate that, uh, John chapter 6 verses 47 uh, it says this, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. So he basically has fulfilled that particular function for us. Uh, we know that we go on to the first fruits and uh, it really celebrates uh, the, the, uh, the resurrection and uh, Jesus Christ is is uh, the first fruits. He is our first fruits. But now Christ has risen from the dead, and this is 1 Corinthians 15 20, and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So he, he is the first one. He's the one that's made a way and a part of that incredible uh, uh, series, that incredible picture um, which we see worked out in the New Testament of Jesus offering himself on the cross uh, as a free will offering. Uh, he's represented as the Lamb of God. Uh, his blood is spilt to pay a price, the ultimate price, which is for us, for humanity, for all humanity, for time and time to come. Up until that time, if you remember, the people of Israel were still slaughtering animals uh, in the temple. And um, they, they continued in that tradition and I, 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 think, um, I think I'm probably safe in saying this. I believe that at, uh, at the, the time of Jesus' uh, death and resurrection, we see not just the fulfilment of those particular feasts, but we see the fulfilment of the temple age, the physical temple age. Because we understand through Scripture that Jesus Christ... Uh, you know, is the new temple. It says that um, when, when uh, the disciples pulled Jesus aside, we know in Matthew, and said, you know, what are going to be the signs of the, of the end times and the coming age? And, you know, they had, they had that little discussion with Jesus and they, they talked about the temple. And, you know, I suppose the Jewish people, the Israelites, had a great sense of, uh, of um, I guess, pride, in the temple which, which had been established, especially Solomon's temple, which was, you know, by all uh, means pretty incredible. It was an incredible uh, temple to house the presence of God. But Jesus Christ has now finished that dispensation or that uh, function. And so there, there is no need now for a physical temple. Uh, it says that we are lively stones uh, the body as believers, we are lively stones and as we come together, we become the habitation of God, the temple of God. So uh, when Jesus was talking about the temple, um, he said the temple will be, will be uh, destroyed, totally destroyed and, uh, and risen uh, again or rebuilt within three days. And what he's really talking about is he's talking about the destruction of his physical being uh, his earthly temple, that body, and and how he will be raised from the dead. But also what it does do is it brings a closing of the chapter, if you like, to the temple. Now, we know that historically um, the Israelite people are still desiring to rebuild a temple, another temple. But I, I don't believe that uh, that ultimately is... Uh, is going to be important because that season and dispensation is already completed and the temple that's to be built now is a spiritual temple. It's, uh, it's, not, it's not an earthly temple or a natural temple, it's a spiritual temple. And that spiritual temple is actually built with the lively stones, the believers, you and I, as we come together, we, we become 
that place of habitation for the Lord. So we see the fulfillment, Jesus' fulfillment in those three feasts. We go on to the Feast of Weeks, which leads right up to Pentecost. And uh, Pentecost, the celebration of Pentecost is, is exactly 50 days after Passover. And what it does is it celebrates the wheat harvest, that first harvest. It's a, it's, it's a uh, part of that particular uh, harvest celebration. But also it celebrates the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is so important. The Holy Spirit is the empowerment for us in these days to function and to live the life that Christ wants us to live in him. And so, you know, I cannot stress enough the importance of the work and the experience of the second baptism, you know, first baptism being the baptism of water, but the second baptism being the baptism in the Holy Spirit for the empowerment of our purpose going forward. And so, so that's, that's, the four, that's the four feasts that we know scripturally uh, and experientially have been fulfilled, firstly through Jesus Christ and secondly through the uh, releasing and the, uh, of the Holy Spirit uh, through Pentecost. What happens in Pentecost is that not just the Holy Spirit is released to the believers at that time, but the formation of the church is established and Acts chapter 2 goes in to the formation of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, I've read lots of books over the years and I've, I've watched, you know, nowadays it's so easy to watch a lot of things on YouTube or online. There's, the resource is, you know, almost inexhaustible. Um, around these topics and, and things, there's just literally hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of writers and writings. And, you know, it's important to navigate through and to go back to the scripture, the word of God, which is infallible, the Word of God is infallible. It is absolute. It is truth. And to find within the Word of God that which the Lord is speaking to us in these days. We begin to move on to the final three feasts. And we, uh, we go on to the Feast of Tabernacles, which is actually made up of three parts. The Feast of Tabernacles. So it starts with the Feast of Trumpets. Ten days later, we move into the Day of Atonement. Uh, and then finally we are at the Feast of Tabernacles. And so this is very, very important because I believe that wrapped up within these feasts uh, show the end time purpose for which the church exists uh, also provides the challenge for us to push into all that God has for us as Christian believers and as the bride of Christ. And so we know that there's a call uh, to holiness. There's a call to being set apart, that we're, we're not to have spot or wrinkle as the bride. You know, uh, I believe that the bride is to be perfected in this time and in this season. And through the duration of these particular uh, divine appointments, and I'm calling the feasts the divine appointments of God within his calendar year, we know that the purpose of the church uh, is not finished uh, just yet. Uh, we have not yet reached the fulfillment of the stature and the fullness of the stature of the Lord Jesus Christ just yet. Last night I made a small admission that uh, I was not yet perfect, and today I can assure you I am still not yet quite perfect. <laughs> but... I think the important thing for us in these days is to understand that we are on a journey to perfection uh, until we are perfected. And so the promise to God is that we will be perfected uh, to the fullness of the stature of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, you know, I, I, I think if you go and look at Scripture you know, it's hard to grapple with because you sort of, you realise that if you don't push on um, with, with uh, let me just say, with, with pushing into all that God has for you related to the perfecting work of the bride, you miss out on so much. 
I, I don't know about where you sit, you know, in your theological position around the, the church or the bride of Christ, but I, I believe that scripturally we're called to be perfected, to be a perfect bride. I think we're called to be a bride without spot or wrinkle, to be a bride without sin. And I'm not just talking about, I'm not just talking about, you know, applying, uh, you know, and apportioning the blood of Jesus through a prayer and saying, Lord, forgive me for my sin. I'm talking about the, the ongoing perfecting work of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives where, where we don't sin, where we, we are uh, the, the reflection of Jesus Christ. Um, it sounds, sounds out there, uh, I know. You probably, some people are probably in their houses right now shaking their heads and thinking, how, how is this possible? I've seen my husband or I've seen my wife and I can't quite picture the perfection of Jesus Christ within, within him or within her. And I want to tell you, it is possible. Uh, scripture says that we, we are to aspire to that. Scripture says that we can achieve that. I think it's very important because the bride of Christ has a significant function in these last days. And, you know, the bride of Christ that is not perfected does not carry or translate the power of God like it needs to be in these days. And so I'll, I'll leave that there for you just to think about and digest uh, for, for a moment. Well, we come to the fifth feast, the fifth divine appointment by God. And we know that in the book of Leviticus, chapter three, 23, we have the, the, the seven feasts laid out and how they were to be followed by the, the people of Israel. We can see in the New Testament the fulfillment of the first four. We're now on to the fifth. And I believe that in the dispensation of time, we are now in the season of the Feast of Trumpets. I believe that this is, we are now in the season that where the trumpet is sounding. The sound is going out to gather together that we may be consecra consecrated, that we may be purified, that we may be set aside and prepared as the bride uh, of Christ. Um, the perfect bride of Christ. And so I... I you know, I know that for some you may wrestle with with that, but that's okay. Uh, it's good to wrestle with things at times. Go back to your word, look at the scripture, see what it is that's written in scripture about the victorious bride of Christ. And that's the picture of what we're meant to be. And I don't believe that that picture is something that happens at the end of the age after all is said and done, all of a sudden we become perfect. Uh, I, I believe there are other experiences for us at the end of the age. We talk, we know that there's a, we take on us spiritual bodies, and you know there's all sorts of things that take place. But I think, as a part of our work on the earth, we're meant to be a better representation of Jesus Christ, the perfect picture. Uh, you know, and so I, I believe that that's a part of the work of these latter feasts. The ones that they say are, are unfulfilled, I believe we're coming into a season of time where these things could be fulfilled in a matter of years. Uh, who knows the calendar of the Lord and how quickly he wants to uh, move things forward. We know that in his time, all things will be fulfilled. So we just have to rest in that and understand that that's a part of his plan. But I can't quite imagine for myself uh, us going into the marriage, supper of the Lamb, into that relationship uh, with Jesus Christ as, as, the, uh, as the bride of Christ and not being perfect. I think we must be perfect in order to be a part of that bride. And so there, there's work to do, church. There is certainly work to do in these days. So I'll lay that as a bit of a premise uh, for these following feasts. So we know that on the first day of the Feast of Trumpets, the trumpets sounded. There are approximately, I believe, there's a hundred blasts in this particular feast that go on. The feast actually um, uh, has nine blasts 
uh, nine different types, sorry, 11 blasts in each type, which gets you to 99 blasts. And then on the 100th blast of the trumpet, or the final trumpet for the Feast of, tap of Trumpets, we, we have that long blast which holds to the full length of the 99 blasts before. And uh, if you were watching last night, you would have seen just a very short snippet. I just provided that uh, little YouTube video as a short snippet for you, just to whet your appetite, as it were, around the trumpets. Um, we know that, that scripturally there are two trumpets. There's trumpets of silver and there's the shofar, the, the ram's horn. And, um, you know, so that, that's, that's a part of this particular feast and the outworking of this particular feast. I personally believe that we are in the time now of the Feast of Trumpets, that, that, that the sound is going, that the trumpet blasts are happening in the realm of the Spirit. Prophetically speaking, there, there are uh, a culmination of uh, the work of, uh, of God that he wants to see within the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is happening as a result of those blasts. And um, some may point to the, uh, the Feast of Trumpets as being um, uh, towards the rapture of the church. As I alluded to last night, I'm not 100% certain. Uh, look, I'm happy to be wrong on this. I think it'd be quite exciting if, if we were raptured uh, here and now. That would be quite an amazing experience, of course. But something within me says there's still more to go. There's more to be done. And um, so I believe that, uh, that there's a purpose uh, in these final feasts or divine appointments, calendar appointments of God, uh, not just for the Israelite nation, but for all of humanity. Because you realise that at the cross, uh, all the paths came together as one. And so... At that point in time, there was a shift in the dispensation that it didn't matter whether you were Jew or Gentile, right? Uh, that Christ makes a way. It says that he is the door. He's the only way, in fact. There is no other way. You may see on the internet or YouTube, you may see various people getting up and saying that, well, you know, maybe there's another way. I want to declare to you that the word of God is absolute truth and it declares very clearly that there is only one way and that way is through Jesus Christ so no other religion uh, has that or no other religion apart from Christianity recognizes the access way or the doorway which is Jesus Christ it calls it the narrow path you know wide is the way that leads to destruction but narrow is the way that leads to eternal life and that's through Jesus Christ. So it's important that we understand that we understand that. So, um, <clears throat> so some may point towards the Feast of Trumpets being a type or a picture for the rapture of the church. I'm not 100% certain of that. Um, I wrestle with that at, 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 to a degree because I feel that the work of the church is not yet finished or complete. There's a lot to do. There's, a, there's an end time harvest that's been promised uh, that is yet to come in, and the fulfilment of that is yet to come in. And uh, for those who do hold to that, uh, to those who do hold to that, I want to encourage you to go and read through the Book of Revelation, and actually look for in the Book of Revelation which trumpet sounds before the second coming. And uh, I want I want you to go and just as a personal exercise, go and have a look and read through the various. Uh, you know, events that take place before the second coming of Jesus. It's, it's an interesting one. I'm saying in that, just to be clear, that uh, I'm not yet convinced of a secret rapture of the church that gets taken away prior to the second coming of Christ. I, I probably at this point in time could be wrong, but at this point in time I see a stronger position for the second coming of Christ and the rapture of the church being the same event, uh, or certainly within the same time frame. So that's that's something which uh, will have you thinking and pondering, and maybe some of you disagreeing, and some of you saying, oh yeah, that makes sense. But I encourage you, go and look at the scripture, see what the scripture literally says and actually says, uh, and see where you come to on that. 
So the Feast of Trumpets. So we know that the Feast of Trumpets is approximately 100 blasts. It takes place. Uh, there's an interesting uh, picture with the Feast of Trumpets because it says in the, in the, in, in the Scripture that uh, they had to actually identify, uh, um, I, th I believe the, the Feast of Trumpets was actually started when two witnesses were able to uh, verify the sighting of the new moon. And they had to go back to the temple and say, we have sighted, and the witnesses would say, we've sighted the, the beginning of the new moon, and that would be verified, and that testimony would be verified as accurate and true, and that would set in course the motion of events for the Feast of Trumpets actually officially starting. It would start with the blast of the trumpet, and those who were within, within earshot would hear that and immediately know that the time had come. It's time to gather. And uh, those who were, were not within earshot, uh, I believe historically what they do is they, they lit, um, uh, they lit the, the uh, bowls of um, oil, and the, they were massive uh, bowls of oil. They lit them up, and they, they lit them up in the temple uh, uh, some commentators actually say that the, the, uh, the brightness of Jerusalem and the temple was so bright that it could be seen, you know, as a result of the illumination of these, uh, these vases or bowls of oil that were, that were uh, set alight. That, that was a, a visual sign that the time had come uh, for the Feast of Trumpets and it's time to gather together and prepare yourself because we know that it was only 10 days later you get to what they call the Day of Atonement. So at that time, they believed that there were fires started on the tops of all the mountains so that all the people from around the area would know and see um, that, that, that something was happening. It was time. It was time for the feast to be celebrated. So we get to the Feast of Trumpets. And um, some may say, for what purpose? Uh, what purpose is the Feast of Trumpets? I, I believe the Feast of Trumpets is partly a progressive uh, uh, feast. Um, it, it doesn't appear to me to be something which is like, uh, uh, you know, it's wrapped up within the last three feasts, what they call the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, the Day of Atonement and the Trumpet Blasts, the Feast of Trumpets. It seems to be a progressive um, uh, revelation that comes at this time you realise that at each of the dispensations of the church through history, they are attached to a particular revelation around the feasts. Um, you know, whether it's justification through faith, you know, or, you know, each of the, each of the different moves of God in the church uh, can be connected back to one of, the, one of the feasts in the sense of the revelation that came forward from that. So we're looking at the Feast of Trumpets and, and new light and sort of saying, what is it, Lord, that you want to do with your body in this time? We know that the Feast of Pentecost or uh, the Day of Pentecost uh, sparked uh, in the early 1900s uh, the Pentecostal revival. Uh, we know that as we go forward into the 1950s, they talk about the... Um, uh, the latter rain movement, another significant move and revelation of God. Um, and so, you know, these are, these are important things. I think it says uh, in the book of Joel uh, that the former and latter rain will come together in the last days uh, for the incredible harvest. And so that's something to consider and ponder upon as we look at these feasts. So the Day of Atonement, so the Feast of Trumpets, it leads up. Ten days before the Day of Atonement, it's considered the beginning of the year or the head of the year. It starts on the first day of the seventh month. In fact, I think all of our calendars, that's according to Leviticus 23, all of our calendars have got a little bit of out of skew uh, these days. And I think, um, I think uh, officially um, after the Babylonian capture in the Old Testament, the, the calendars got a little bit out of whack. And they say that um, I think now they actually uh, have the Feast of Trumpets this year starting on the 8th or the 7th, sorry, I can't quite remember that, 7th or the 8th of September 2021. So it's just coming up in another week or so. This celebration will be celebrated right across the Middle East 
and probably around the world to those who are following and recognising the significance of these feasts. Um, for what purpose are these feasts? I, I believe that these last ones are really about the perfection and the perfecting of the body of Christ. I think last night I looked at the, the uh, scriptures from Ephesians 4 uh, and, the, and the releasing of the fivefold ministry gifts or the gifts of men, it says, uh, the apostles, the pastors, the preachers, uh, apostle, pastor, teacher, uh, mate, evangelist, apostle, pastor, teacher, and I can't even remember the last one. It must, must have been a big day today. <laughs> but we know the fivefold, the fivefold ministry. Uh, the prophet, that's what it is. So the apostle, prophet, teacher, pastor, evangelist. Uh, they're gifts. They're men who have been gifted to the body to bring them to the perfection, the stature of the Lord Jesus Christ, the full stature of the Lord Jesus Christ. We get to that tenth day, the day of atonement. This is probably considered in the Israel calendar the most holy of days um, you know um, many believe this prophetically points to the day of the second coming of Jesus when he will return uh, I don't necessarily disagree with that I think that there's pretty good scriptural evidence to say that the day of atonement there, there's obviously in that particular experience I think we can see the second coming of Jesus. Uh, it's interesting that the Jewish people look at the Day of Atonement or that time frame that leads up to the Day of Atonement from, from trumpets to atonement. They actually, they, actually, um, they actually believe that God has three books. This is quite an interesting one. And um, what, what, they, what they believe is the Day of Atonement as the time that God opens the Book of Life and determines who will be safe for another year. This is how they, this is how they, uh, they view it. So leading up to this point of atonement, they're furiously wanting to get themselves right. They're wanting to put aside everything that, that would be a stumbling block. And so what they believe is that they, they are, there are three books, one for those who are really righteous, and I think, uh, I think they're definitely safe, those who are written in that particular book. Uh, I'm not saying I adhere to this belief. This is just a very interesting picture, and I want to lead it somewhere, uh, which, which which will help you understand this. But they believe the you know those those who are really righteous were written in the first book, and they were definitely safe. Uh, there was another book for those who were really wicked. The, they were they were uh, really bad, and uh, they were definitely in big trouble when it came to the Day of Atonement. Um, but there's also a third book for those who are somewhere in between and uh, who was not yet known whether they were going to make it or not make it. So, you know, this has led, this has led uh, to them for those 10 days between the trumpets and atonements trying to do their best, hoping that it's good enough uh, that they could be safe for another year. Yeah, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting picture. Um, we know that there's, a, there's the Lamb's Book of Life and we certainly desire to have our names written in that book and assures our future. And I'm not really too sure about the other books. I don't, I don't quite know uh, where we find that uh, specifically scripturally. But what I do know for a fact is that we cannot earn our way into heaven and we cannot earn our way through. It doesn't matter how good we are, how many good works we do, how many hungry we feed, how many people we pick up and drop off to the supermarket or all the good works. It doesn't matter how much good works we do. It will never be enough to get us through. And so we, we cannot uh, and we must not rely on being good people uh, or um, carrying just good works. I, I'm not saying we shouldn't do good works. I think we should. I think it should be a natural expression of our walk as Christian believers and, our, and as the, the bride of Christ, the church of Christ, we, we must be uh, functioning. There. there is good works in that, but it's, it's, at, it's, it's as a part of the function of the Holy Spirit within us and through us, uh, and it's certainly not a part of uh, us earning our way uh, into heaven 
or, uh, you know, uh, we cannot do that. There is only one way. That is through Jesus Christ. He paid the price, the ultimate price on the cross for us. He was sinless. He was perfect. He did not deserve to go there, but he willingly offered himself as a sacrifice to make a way for us. And that road, that way through Jesus Christ is the only way where we can be sure that we're going to make it through, especially in these last days. Don't discount the importance of the previous experiences, baptism in water, baptism by the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, because, because those experiences are vital for us being healthy and whole and on our journey to perfection uh, in Jesus Christ. And so, you know, I believe the, the ultimate purpose of these, of these feasts is around the perfection of the bride, the church. I think the further we go uh, in the end times, and specifically when we're looking at those two books of Hebrews and Revelation, in fact, all of the books of the New Testament, really, but we see the picture of the bride of Christ, the church, and the importance that is placed on the church in these days. And the church must be ready, the bride must be ready without spot wrinkle, perfected. And uh, the bride that is not perfected does not make it. Uh, sin and darkness does not have any fellowship with light. We know that Jesus is the light. There is no darkness in him. And so it's important that we understand and we allow the work, uh, that, that work, that continuing work of um, perfection to go on uh, as promised by Scripture. And part of the function of the fivefold gifts to the church was to bring the body to perfection. And the reason for bringing the body to perfection is I, I actually believe because it's a part of the end times mandate that the church has in the last days. We must be perfected to last, to be strong under intense persecution and opposition, but we must also be perfected to carry the power of the Holy Spirit and the, the uh, anointed of God uh, into the marketplace to see the incredible salvation of souls in these last days. So I just think it's very, very important. So for what purpose? That's a question. I believe the purpose is the perfection of the bride, the church, to the full stature of Jesus Christ. Atonement. I read this somewhere and I wrote it down. Uh, it means at one meant. Atonement. At one meant. Where the church now perfected is married to Christ. A people who have died to self have measured up to the full stature of the man, Christ Jesus, and are perfected as his bride. And I believe that is really the overarching plan through these particular feasts and these encounters with God. Ephesians 4.13, it says this, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And that scripture really is talking about the church, uh, you know, the, the bride, uh, we'll, we'll call that uh, the church in these days. Imagine the power and authority of the church, his bride, in this state. Imagine the power and the authority of the church, his bride, in this state. What I mean in the state, I mean perfected. You know, uh, just on a very small note, you know, how good do you feel when you know you've, you've put aside all the obvious sin? You know, hopefully we're not involved in, in overt sin. But we, when we're in right standing with God and we, we know we've got everything in order before him and we're just doing the best, how good do you feel, you know, in that particular state? And how, how much more... Uh, will the church, you know, the bride feel when it is perfected, when it actually is without spot or wrinkle, how powerful that will be. And the picture of that is quite incredible. I believe in this time the trumpets are blowing, end time seals and trumpets will sound, and the church, the bride, perfected as a part of the end times harvest. So I believe the time, and this time, the trumpets are blowing. I, I believe, I very much believe we're in that time of the, the trumpets. 
So the trumpets are blowing, end time seals, the trumpets are sounding in the church, and the bride perfected. The bride perfected is a part of the final end times harvest. What sort of church or bride is Jesus coming for? Very simple, one without spot or wrinkle. And we move on to the seventh day. Now, this is quite interesting, the seventh day. We're talking about the Feast of Tabernacles. And, you know, maybe Dad will talk a little bit more about this uh, in the coming sessions. I've been seconded in for these last two days. I trust you've, you've been able to endure uh, to the end. But, uh, you know, as, as Dad comes, and I know he's going to share a lot more probably around this, I'll just start by highlighting a few things and bring it, bring it to sort of a, a bit of a natural close. But one thing that I do understand is from Bible scripture is that the, the blowing of the trumpets, uh, the Feast of Trumpets, that really does bring us through to the end of what they call the sixth day, right? We know that uh, in creation, uh, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, he created everything in six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. That's what Genesis says. Uh, we also understand that through Scripture, we are pretty close to 6,000 years from the beginning, from Adam to, to where we are now. We know that it's 2,000 years from Adam to Abraham. We know that it's about 2,000 years from Abraham to, to Jesus. And we know that we're, we're around 2,000 years from, from Jesus to where we are now. So we're, we're pretty close to that 6,000 uh, year mark. Um, and so we, we look at it in the type or the picture of days, right? Uh, so there are six days for which God is to fulfill his plan for humanity or the redemptive plan for humanity. And on the seventh day will be a day of rest. We know that the seventh uh, feast, the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, really points to the promise of, uh, I suppose, a day of rest or a day of tabernacling. <laughs> That's a funny word, isn't it? to tabernacle. It's a word that doesn't come off the tongue very easily. But we know that um, the scripture, it actually talks about in the book of John 1, verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In many other translations, uh, where it says dwelt, it actually is translated tabernacled. And what that means, you know, I suppose, is, is that the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us or was with us or lived with us. We came into that close fellowship. We know that Jesus Christ is obviously the one that the Scripture is referring to. And when we get to the final feast, the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, many of the scholars, the Bible scholars, believe that the feast day points to the Lord's promise that he will once again tabernacle with his people when he returns to reign over the world for the thousand-year reign or the millennium on earth. I think if there was a dispensation, an uh, end-times dispensation, that I would firmly believe, I believe the second coming happens before the millennium, <laughs> the final thousand years. Uh, that probably encompasses the pre, the mid, the post, and everyone else in between. Um, and it's a very safe position to hold. But the final thousand-year reign, we see that, that that is a temporary uh, a temporal reign before the, the great white uh, judgment seat. Uh, we're looking, if you're look, looking through the book of Revelation, you'll find uh, this terminology in some of these things. Um, <laughs> and that's the, that's the tabernacling of us together with God, with perfect peace with Christ Jesus as the head, and, and reigning from his kingdom for a thousand years with his bride, uh, the church, the perfect bride, I might add, the church. And so the Feast of Tabernacles is celebrated as seven days of incredible rejoicing. How many of you know that there's incredible rejoicing once you've dealt with all the mucky stuff around your life, that it's very easy to be happy and rejoicing because there, there should come an immense joy from being free. But there's, in this particular feast, it's seven days of rejoicing before the Lord while all Israel lives in booths. And so even to this very day when they go into the Feast of Tabernacles, 
they build these booths, which are usually three-sided lean-to type structures off the sides of their houses, made out of timber uh, branches, and usually the roof is not completely covered, but it's see-through, so you can see the stars, and uh, most often covered with, uh, with uh, palm leaves or thatched, something thatched or something that is, is able to be seen through, so you, it's, not a, it's, not a closed, it's not a closed top. And uh, this, is, this time of tabernacles is really a time following uh, the final ingathering of the final harvest of promise. Um, you know, just as a, as a little side note um, around the, the tabernacles, we know that Jesus was, uh, in fact, it's gone, it goes by another name too, it goes by the Feast of Booths, but we know that Jesus was our tabernacle. Um, he was a picture of that. And so the celebration fo always follows the Day of Atonement. The Feast of Tabernacles celebrates God's provision and protection for his people. It does go back, and they, they do go back. The reason why uh, they have the booths or the tabernacles with the open roofs is because it goes back to the time when they were wa wandering through uh, the wilderness, you know, in temporary dwellings. And um, we know that, you know, even... God himself ordained a tent of meeting uh, in that time uh, while they were in the desert and they called that tent of meeting the tabernacle. <clears throat> so, the, so the feast also celebrates his presence as he tabernacles or dwells with us. Uh, you know, I know that there's a lot more I'm probably rushing the tail end of this particular part uh, of, uh, of the feast. So I know there's a lot more to dig into but I wanted to just provide a little bit of a base uh, groundwork there for you and some plenty of thoughts when you go back and look at your word and to digest, discuss. Look, if you have questions over what's been spoken, please you know, send us an email or a message. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, we'd love to be able to digest and discuss uh, you know, openly uh, with a spirit of humility uh, you know, what we're discussing here around the feasts. And uh, I trust that you know, as we've looked uh, very quickly at the foundations of these particular feasts. We know four have been fulfilled. We know three are to be fulfilled. And I certainly suspect that one is in play and is being fulfilled uh, progressively uh, at this time and season. Uh, but of course, some of the other ones really relate, I think, quite strongly, especially Tabernacles relates quite strongly to that habitation where God habits uh, has a habitation with us and us with him, probably points strongly to that thousand year reign where we're actually together uh, as the bride uh, with him. I trust this has been encouraging, uh, that you've enjoyed the dissecting of the scripture. Be blessed, church. We look forward to uh, being able to catch up in person. Nothing beats the catching up in person. The scripture says even more so as the days uh, come to an end or in the last days, gather even more so. It's more important for us. And so I believe that that is a word for us too. When we get out of lockdown, let's gather the church together. Let's gather our families together. Let's come back into the house of the Lord and celebrate corporately, collectively, as his bride, as his body in these days, to celebrate all the good things that he is doing. So over the coming weeks, we know that these particular feasts are being played out, uh, certainly in the natural uh, in the Middle East and around the world. And, you know, let's, let's dig in to see what God has for us and that all that he has for us in these days. Be blessed, be encouraged, have a great week.